ಸಂಜೆ ಎಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಶುಭ ಸಂಜೆ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಟು ದಿಸ್ ಬ್ಯೂಟಿಫುಲ್ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಆಫ್ ದೇವಭಾಷಾ ಲಾಂಚ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅ ಪ್ಯಾನಲ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಷನ್ ಆನ್ ಮೇಕಿಂಗ್ ಕಲ್ಚರ್ ಕೂಲ್ ದಟ್ ಯು ಆಲ್ ಬೀನ್ ಲುಕಿಂಗ್ ಫಾರ್ವರ್ಡ್ ಟು ಮೈ ನೇಮ್ ಇಸ್ ಚಾರುಸ್ಮಿತಾ ರಾವ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಟುಗೆದರ್ ವಿತ್ ನೀಲ ಕಂಠನ್ ವಿ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಯೋರ್ ಹೋಸ್ಟ್ ಫಾರ್ ದ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಆ್ಯಸ್ ದ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಬಿಹೈಂಡ್ ಕಲ್ಚರ್ ಡಿಸೈನ್ಸ್ ಹೌ ಮೆನಿ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಹವ್ ಹರ್ಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಕಲ್ಚರ್ ಡಿಸೈನ್ಸ್ ಶೋ ಆಫ್ ಹ್ಯಾಂಡ್ಸ್ wonderful thank you that was a that was actually a rather impressive show of hands considering how tiny we are and um, culture designs is a small idea a tiny idea that took birth somewhere in 2013 when we used to work together we used to wonder why corporates mostly use western frameworks and how come indian frameworks and thoughts were missing one thing led to another and we set up culture designs an amalgamation of cool and culture the simple idea we believe in is that if culture is perceived as cool people will gravitate to it and therefore we are creators everything we have done has had a creation component to it we have created and experimented with a few ideas like parampare our heritage themed jewelry city in a box which we called as bengaluru or bengaluru in a dubbi temple trail postcard series which then led to products like 108% indian playback and today devabasha uh, how many of you noticed the songs played in the background as you were all settling i know people were busy taking pictures selfies but how many of you noticed the songs yeah okay nice uh, what did you notice yeah yeah thank you every single song was sanskritam songs composed and put together by team satwa sanskritam academy for teacher training and value addition and the team satwa works at many levels from sanskrit education to music to awareness building to social service these songs are yet another way to make sanskrit accessible to people can we hear a round of applause for satwa thank you before we begin this evening let's hear a small invocation chant by dr swaroop ranganath and arvind butt from the satwa team the invocation invokes lord ganesha the remover of obstacles saraswati the goddess of knowledge and the mahatmas who worked for the welfare of this country ಗಣಪತಿ ಗುಂಹವಾಮೇಟಿಂಕವೀನಾಪಮಶ್ರವಸ್ತಮ ಜ್ಯೇಷ್ಠರಾಜ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಣ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಣಸ್ಪತ ಆರ ಶೃಣ್ವನ್ನೋತಿ ಸೀದಸಾಧನ ಓಘ್ನೇಶ್ವರಾಯ ನಮಃ ಪ್ರಣೋದೇವಿ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ವಾಜೇಭರ್ವಾಜಿನೀವತಿ ಭೀನಾಮವಿತ್ರ್ಯವತು ಚೋದಯಿತ್ರಿ ಸುಂದೃತಾಂಚೇತಿ ಸುಮತೀನಾಧೆ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ವಾಗ್ದೇವ್ಯೈ ನಮಃ ಪುರಾಣೆ ವೇದ ವಿಗುಂಸಮಿ ವದಂತ್ಯಮೇವ ತೆ ಪರಿವದಂತಿ ಅಗ್ನಿತೀಯ ಗುಂಸಮಿತಿ ದೇವತೇದ ವಿಧಿ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣೆ ವಸಿ ತಸ್ಮಾಣೇಭ್ಯೋ ವೇದ ವಿಧ್ಯೋ ದಿವೇದಿ ನಮಸ್ಕುರಿಯಾಂಕೀರ್ತೀಡಾತಿ ಓ 
what an energetic and calming invocation that was. Thank you, Dr. Swaroop and Arvind Bhatt. Um, let's put our hands together to welcome our esteemed guests onto the stage for lighting the lamp. Padma Shri, Dr. Sridhar Vembu. The founder, CEO, and the poster boy of the SaaS revolution in India. Let's, let's hear. May I invite Sri J. Sai Deepa, Supreme Looks like he needs no introduction. J. Sai Deepak, Supreme Court lawyer and author. May I invite uh, Padma Shri Dr. Rutger Cottonhorst. <laughs> about whom I will speak a little bit more later. May I ask our guests to initiate the proceedings of the day by lighting the auspicious lamp. I request our guests to take their seats. It's really our honor and privilege to felicitate our three guests for this evening. We're starting with Dr. Sridhar Vembu, who is known for a variety of things, from owning an auto rickshaw to playing cricket in the fields and doing all of this while running a billion dollar software company, Zoho. May I call upon Sri Naresh Choudhury to felicitate Dr. Sridhar Vembu. Naresh Choudhury started from a textile background, moved into technology, and among other things, has built an entire business unit in Infosys from scratch. Dr. Swaroop and Arvind Bhatt will be doing the Sabha Vandana chanting during the felicitation. Namasadate, Namasadasas Pataye, Namasaki Nam Puroga Nan Jakshushe, Namodive, Namaprutivye, Saprathasabham Megopaya, Yetasabhya Sabhasadaha. Now we would love to felicitate Sri J. Sai Deepak, who is a rock star Supreme Court advocate. <laughs> Dr. 
Well, well, when was the last time a Supreme Court advocate had such a fan following? Any <laughs> He has also written two best-selling books that we highly recommend each one of you to read, which one of which is releasing just this week. I call, call upon Sri Lakshmi Narayanji to felicitate Sri J. Sai Deepak. Sri Lakshmi Narayanji has built Gurukula in Sri Rangpatna, which is one of its kind. He is known for building an ecosystem which has supported hundreds of students, mostly. mostly from low-income groups who are flourishing today as accomplished professionals contributing to the society. Thank you, sir. You heard me mention Padma Shri Dr. Ratgar Cottonhurst. How many of you already know who he is? Show of hands. Wow, wonderful. So in the year 2022, Government of India conferred the Padma Shri Award, the third highest award in the Padma series of awards on Rodger Cottonhorst for his distinguished service in the field of education and literature. The award is in recognition of his service as an Irish Sanskrit scholar promoting Ayurveda, Sanskrit and yoga globally. Sri Ratgar is an inspiration as someone who has managed to spread Sanskrit in a foreign country. He also, fun fact, he also speaks Sanskrit fluently than most of us. When Narendra Modi was in Ireland, he got a welcome, a Vedic welcome. The reason behind the Vedic welcome in Ireland to Narendra Modi was... May I call upon Sri Raghuveer to felicitate Sri Ratgar. Sri Raghuveer is a cyber security expert and runs a high-end technology security company from Namma Bengaluru. Thank you, Dr. Swaroop and Arvind. Uh, Ratkar, if you could share a few words on your experience on teaching Sanskrit in Ireland. What did it take for you to spread the Sanskrit in a foreign land? What words of wisdom do you have for us? Om <coughs> Om Paramatmane Namaha Atta. This is how we begin in Ireland in our school with each class. <laughs> and at the end of the class, Om Paramatmane Namaha Iti. So. Uh, <coughs> we have uh, 200 children in uh, Ireland doing Sanskrit 
in our school, they're usually five-year-olds up to 12-year-olds, so they're very small. <laughs> so uh, because they're so small, we teach them through songs. I think I'll give, share one song with you now. Do you get a sample of what we do? So it's teaching the children grammar, but they don't know they're learning grammar. <laughs> so. I am mama hasta, I am mama para, I am mama kanta, I am mama oshta, I am mama danta, I am mama gulpa, I am mama skanda, I am mani banda, I am mama nasa, I am mama grifa, I am mama tanga, I am mama chifa. Ida mama <coughs> netram, ida mama chibukam, ida mama hridayam, ida mama udaram. <laughs> so. <coughs> like this, uh, children in Ireland are learning about 150 songs. Like this, they learn their Sanskrit. So we don't tell them they're learning grammar, but they're learning grammar. So this is the trick. When you, as you know, when you have learned a song from childhood, you will never forget. Because you'll know every song from your childhood still now. So by putting the songs into them, into their minds, they will have, we have planted a seed of uh, knowledge there and we hope it will uh, fructify and flourish and make them into wonderful human beings. Our belief is that because Sanskrit is beautiful, structured, and scientific, those children will also get those qualities. So the qualities that, we, uh, that is in the Sanskrit language will become the qualities of us. So if Sanskrit is Shanta, then we'll also become Shanta. And we have experienced, all of us, I think, know about this. So this is the reason why we're teaching. So if any parents ask us, why do you do this? We say, this is the reason. So the, everything uh, that goes in is because it's the best. And really, we need to uh, start looking for the East to get the wisdom which we sorely lack in the West. And we can combine both, and this will be good for all. So that's uh, the aim, and it's really a universal aim. It doesn't really matter what background we have. It doesn't really matter where we live. Sanskrit is the universal language. Eng <coughs> so, yeah. With, uh, people may often say to me, but English is the universal, and, and I say, no, no, no. English is the dominant language. <laughs> Very different. <laughs> so, uh, some, immediately we will feel some ahankara, with, yeah, and we won't feel that with Sanskrit. They're only pure Atman. Yeah. So, uh, very easy to, uh, for children, they feel the, their spiritual uh, being is still very strong when they're small. So they immediately want to learn and they grasp quickly and they say, we, our problem is the teachers, we don't know enough the children would go much faster if we had really super teachers. So we're beginning where we are, and every year we are growing. This is since 1986, but I only began in 2008 with this program. So we're, we're developing, uh, so the school is many years old, but we decided only in this school, there must, one thing must be there, and that's the Sanskrit language. And it's worked, so. We started with 15 children, now there are 250 children. So obviously people like it. So that's the, yeah, the background. So uh, culturing people in the universal level means they can also understand their local culture better. That's we didn't realize. We didn't really understand our own culture until we started studying Vedanta. So Vedanta gives us insights into our own culture which deepen our knowledge even in that field. So we're very grateful for this beautiful jewel that we've got. 
This language is not just a language. It's a way of life. It's really, that's what it is. It's, it has become my life. And I hope for all of us, this is the way to go. So it goes, it's, you start maybe with some small interest, that's enough. And after that, it will flourish. And I hope uh, that will be your story as much as my story. So I'll finish with Om Paramatmani Namaha Iti. Thank you for such encouraging and inspiring words, Rutger. So, we reach a point both you and all of us have been waiting for, the panel discussion on making culture cool. You're already familiar with our esteemed panelists, Dr. Sridhar Vembu and Sri J. Sai Deepak. Our moderator for the evening is Neela Kanton. Neil is the co-founder of Culture Designs, the brain behind two of our products, 108% Indian and Deva Basha. Couple of rules and instructions as the panel gets started. The panel discussion will be moderated by Neil. Audience can pass on questions via cards. I hope you all have the plain cards with the culture logo on it, which our volunteers uh, will have in case you don't have already. Please ask for a card, write your questions, and they will be shared with the moderator. The panelists are highly accomplished in their own fields, and while it may be really tempting, for you to ask questions to Jaisai Deepak on the legal framework of India and to Sridhar on the state of tech industry in India, we would suggest that you keep the questions focused on Indian culture. Thank you, Charu. So we begin the panel discussion and uh, with your permission, what I would like to do is to start you off with a question and I would like uh, each of you to respond for one minute. Uh, I have a series of three questions and we can go one after the other. So, if I could get you started, uh, Sridhar sir. Sridhar, what is your view of an Indian culture? What is typically associated with Indian culture? And what are the pitfalls, the cliché? Just a minute on it. Really, the defining characteristic of Indian culture, Bharatiya culture, is the, the fact that we are not an atomized society of individuals, but uh, more a uh, molecular clusters. I use chemical language here. We are not individual atoms. We are connected to a whole. And uh, it's families, communities, villages, towns, all of that. There's all this connection. Our uh, language background, our religious background, all of these. And it is that, in fact, I got a glimpse of that much more by living in America. How much different that uh, perspective is that I got a more uh, and sometimes when you go abroad then only you actually realize what is the root of your own culture is so that's what I realized that it's uh, really that connective tissue and one of the defining characters of that is contentment that we are uh, we are probably the most contented of people I mean, we may not be very contented but if you go around you will see this why contentment is important and it's even more important given the challenges the world faces, whether it's global warming, any of that. Because no one has figured out how to be prosperous while being contented. If anybody is going to figure that out, that's going to be India and that's going to be the Vishwa Guru. We have to teach the world this. So that's, that's to be that Thank you for setting the tone, uh, Sridhar. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Sai the same question. I think as far as uh, Bharatiya culture is concerned, you think of it as the journey of the human civilization. So while one may be tempted to glorify it as perhaps the epitome of perfection, I would steer clear of it and to simply call it the journey of the human civilization with all its, let's say, pitfalls and its perfections. So therefore, when you approach any other culture, there is a tendency to let's say glorify it and there is a tendency to add a lot of let's say embellishments to it. You don't need to do that with Bharatiya culture for two reasons. One because at least I believe that it happens to be the oldest and therefore like dharma 
instead of looking at it from a value addition perspective as to whether it is good or bad, I would simply say it is what it is. And therefore, if you look at most of our customs, or let's say the way we have structured a society, it has a certain element of being organic, which is to say that you try and meld as much as possible without making too much of a change in individual customs, which makes it possible for you to forge a larger, let's say, identity without having to give up a lot of sub-identities. So while I'm not a student of anthropology and I certainly cannot claim to be, let's say, an expert on the particular subject, assume for a moment that there was perhaps a racial component to this culture at some point of time or an ethnocentric component to this culture at some point of time. I think this is perhaps one of the few cultures which was quick enough to give up that particular component and to focus more on consciousness as opposed to race. So therefore, each time, whenever we have contentious discussions about, let's say, the Aryan invasion theory, so on and so forth, one attempt is to negate that particular theory, which I think must be done, provided there's a scientific basis. But as a lawyer, I would look for a plan B argument, which is that assume for a moment that the Aryan invasion theory is a reality. Let's assume that is indeed the case. So what would be my next question? So what? The question then would be, has this particular culture retained its, let's say, Aryan sense from a racial perspective? Or has it tried to open its doors more from a knowledge and consciousness perspective? In which case, why would you want to crucify the culture, pun intended, on the anvils of race as opposed to its subsequent learnings and its subsequent evolution, so to speak? So. I am not in a position to say that the out of India theory or the out of Africa theory has more evidence than the Aryan invasion theory. That's for subject matter experts to speak. I am happy to proceed with the argument that assuming for a moment it was, let's say there is an Aryan element to it which is racial in nature. One, it may not have been invasion. It could have been plain and simple immigration. But assuming that there is an invasion, subsequently is there, let's say, a racial component the way you have in the in Islam, so to speak, where there is a deification of a particular ethnic identity which continues till date. Okay, so therefore, according to me, of all the things that Max Mueller said, which I don't subscribe to significantly, but the one thing that I certainly think makes a lot of sense is that given the longevity and the sheer, let's say, length of or the duration of this particular culture's journey, so to speak, there are perhaps no mistakes which have been committed here which have not been committed elsewhere. And perhaps there are no better things that we have done which have not, which don't exist elsewhere. So the good, bad, and the ugly, they all exist in this particular crucible. So I would see this culture and this particular subcontinent as not just a microcosm, but a macrocosm itself of the universe, or at least of, of the rest of the world, so to speak. Because given its diversity in terms of geography, given its diversity in terms of facial features and physical features and all sorts of attributes, it is a representation of the world for all practical purposes, and which is why it's a country that, ma or rather it's a subcontinent that masquerades as a country, which has a serious bearing, including on the way the culture has evolved, okay? So the one thing that I've tried to tell people wherever possible is if you look at the way Christianity has gone about appropriating stuff, there is a tendency sometimes to equate Christian appropriation of pre-Christian pagan European culture with the so-called Vedic Hinduism's appropriation of local customs and so on and so forth. That false equivalence and that false symmetry is often drawn. I don't think there's a basis for that at all because each of these customs continue to have the very same importance that they used to to the extent that people have the option of not, let's say, deifying or worshipping Vedic gods, so to speak, and still retaining their allegiance to non-Vedic gods, if at all there is such a distinction. This, according to me, is the single biggest takeaway. I know that there is a lot of, let's say, scope for mischief in the statement that I've just made, but I'm trying to be as clear as possible with a clear caveat that I don't think that the evidence tilts in favor of the Aryan invasion theory, but assuming it does, according to me, it still makes no difference to the fact that we are connected by the umbilical cord called dharma. That cannot be taken away. And given the fact that this particular experiment, so to speak, has worked for over 5,000 years at the very least, and that's a cliched figure which I don't put stock in, even if that figure is valid, if something has worked for 5,000 years, 
it is proof of the fact as to why Bharat has significantly retained its dharmic identity despite multiple waves of colonization. That shows that this particular synthesis that we have evolved is a time-tested synthesis, which is why others are going to struggle to try and uproot us. Okay, thank you. So to summarize, I'll start with what uh, Sai Deepak said. One, this is a culture that has been around for a long time where we have moved beyond race and actually looked at consciousness as a, as an, as an, as a uniting factor. And the fact that we have been around for a long time, we have done mistakes, but we've also done good things. And that is what has to be appreciated about our culture. Um, Sridhar, on the other hand, makes the point that we are likely one of the only culture that has a view of containment and uh, prosperity. Am I, yeah? And that is something we should keep in mind as we move along. So with this, I want to move to the second question. Again, you can um, respond at length. The question is, uh, and I would like uh, Sai Deepak to start first. How does culture spread? What does it take to make it happen? And uh, one of the contexts you can probably use here is, for example, the kind of inroads that South Korean culture has made into India. So just your view on how does culture spread, using this probably as an example. I don't know if I'm in a position to give a general response to it because I don't know how other cultures have spread. But I happen to come across some fairly good literature, at least as far as Bharati culture is concerned, that there has been a conscious attempt uh, to tie two aspects. I think religion and language, or rather faith and language, I don't want to use the word religion, but dharma and language have gone hand in hand as far as Bharat is concerned, which reflects significantly in two aspects. One, there are very few portions of Bharat where the two epics don't find an audience, or there are no local manifestations of those two epics where there are no, let's say, usages and idioms which don't draw significantly from the two epics. Whenever you think of a student-teacher relationship, you have very clear examples that come from the Mahabharata. Whenever you think of brothers, so to speak, while the popular example is Rama and Lakshmana, perhaps Rama and Bharata would be the better example to give. Similarly, when you think of strength, you think of Bhima, you think of Hanuman, so on and so forth. So that tells you that as far as Bharata is concerned, uh, dharma has played a significant role in the spread of this particular culture to the extent that it has used Sanskrit as a way of forging unity at the same time not having this expansionist tendency which perhaps other languages have which swallow up local languages. So when someone tries to say that let's say Sanskrit is a representation of Aryan supremacy, so on and so forth, and therefore uh, it needs to be resisted and repelled and so on and so forth, then how do you explain the survival of other languages? Now let me try and use their own argument against them. So when each time we say that Bharat has survived multiple Islamic invasions, their argument is no, you, couldn't, you cannot make that statement because if we were so all-conquering and if this was the intention, how do you explain the the continued presence of Hindus is their argument. So no, let's say, uh, credit is given to Hindu resistance to Islamic invasions. Now let's try and apply the very same framework to languages. One, you have to look for two markers. One, can Sanskrit and other languages coexist? Is there proof of their coexistence? The answer would be a clear yes. Second, is there any instance where so-called Sanskrit purists have looked down upon translation of Sanskrit epics in other languages. To the best of my knowledge, even if there, be, there have been such, let's say, examples that would be far and few in between. Three, do you have examples of linguistic rebellion and revolt where someone has chosen to say, to hell with Sanskrit, and as far as we are concerned, this is an alien language and we will continue to abide by only these languages. Significantly, each of these tendencies can be traced only to the advent of the missionary spirit in Bharat after the advent of Christianity in Bharat, to a significant extent. Or not just the advent of Christianity, I would say this has started perhaps more in the colonial period. So when you look at each of these markers, I think 
this is perhaps one of those few cultures which while it has the ability to claim that it is the fount of all knowledge or it has the ability to sh let's say shine the light on the rest of the world is more than happy to listen and hear views from across the board. So this is one of those examples where someone who has the ability to dominate chooses not to dominate and is happy to listen. This I think is the mark of knowledge and power when melded with humility what Bharat's let's say culture would look like. I think the West has a lot to learn from this. <laughs> it's easy for us to chest thump and say that we have done this, we have done that. The innate tendency of most Bharatiyas is to underplay. This is not an individual quality, this is a cultural quality. This is a collective quality. So, yeah. Uh, thank you. I think I'm going to come to some of those points uh, as we go along. Um, the point on underplaying and the, and the point which you mentioned on knowledge and power coexisting. I want to ask the same question to Sridhar. Again, how does culture spread and what does it take to make it happen? And the context for you is the work you have done in Tenkashi. You know, how did you make it happen? There is, there's, you have actually managed to do something. And this is one point I'll keep coming back to you again and again. But if you could throw some light on that, Sridhar. I'll, I'll first uh, to give an idea of you know, what a rural life is there. Um, I went on this pilgrimage last year. So the villagers every year go on pilgrimage. That's so true in so many parts. This was Thai Pursam. Thai Pursam is a festival and there is a Murugan Kovil, Subramanya temple near the near a hillock nearby, about 10 kilometers away. So we get up in the morning, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and we walk the 15 kilometers. And uh, everybody calls each other Swami, Swami, right? Swami in Tamil. Then I would ask him, so, so you are Swami, he is Swami, I am Swami. So where are we going? To visit the Swami. <laughs> right? So all the Swamis are going to visit the Swami. They are on the hill. <laughs> this, I mean, this is, this is actually the, literally the language used. Swami, Swami, Swami and Swami to go visit the Swami there. So this is to me the kind of the profound, in other words, people truly understand the meaning of these things, right? This is profound. And so at that time, when you are a pilgrim, you are divine, actually. You are divine. And then you are going to go visit the divine. You being divine. So this, this particular, this is pervasive. You visit villages, practically everyone goes on a pilgrimage or rather. So you'll have many opportunities. So I tried to partake in this once in a while. So I, I was happy to do this last year. And so to me, that is so, that's the core of our thing and, and um, the contentment, where it comes from, it's again, to us, I mean, my siblings, all of us, it came from our parents directly. My parents, to this day, they, they retain the same lifestyle they always had. And to them, you know, all the money doesn't mean anything. I mean, they just, uh, it's the same life they always had. And after seeing my father and my mother being that way, I'm, you know, I, I'd be very reluctant to have adopt any other lifestyle. <laughs> It'd be difficult, <laughs> as I say, right? So that, to me, that, you know, again, it comes from, hopefully we are, you know, siblings, myself, we are setting that same example to our children, the same uh, uh, thing. That's how it spreads. There's no, you know, the carrying is going on from parent to child that way. And same way, the, the, the pilgrimage, that again, all the everybody calling each other Sami, that is again that culture you know, is transmitted that way. And that's the, the root of contentment comes from all these very simple things. It's not anything big. In fact, uh, you know, you asked about the other side of uh, village life, a lot of uh, small ego clashes will happen. For example, I always joke there is a small stream that runs through our village, it forks near our place, uh, it goes to village one and village two. Periodically, uh, a small fight will erupt on which, which direction the stream will flow. And uh, actually, the way people do it, it's kind of weird, right? They'll block, one, one, one community will come and block it, then the other guys will come and block it. So I think they'd be both better off if they just let it flow both directions, right, equally. But no, they love to do this. It just gives, but this, in fact, I saw this way these constant small struggles like this also strengthen your uh, spirituality in a way. 
I, I saw it for uh, what it is. <laughs> now, we are constantly doing these small things like this. But in a way, then, you know, when you put on the garb as a pilgrim, you forget all this. You set this aside a little bit also. So I have seen both, right? So it's not by no means, you should not assume life is perfect. I don't want to paint a picture. In fact, uh, even this morning, you know, I was told there was a panjayat going on about some issue or other. And I am very much now part of it. I get pulled into some of these. Sometimes, you know, I have to weigh in and say, please, let's not fight over this. And people do listen. So those are the, that's how the rural life is. That's how our life at the, that's how our whole civilization is constructed. But here is the thing, right? Our, uh, this is something uh, Gurumurthy Ji has pointed out many times. Our nearest police station is about eight kilometers away. There are six policemen for a population, what, about uh, 25 villages together. <laughs> and somehow we keep the peace. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is something, you know, that is impressive. That you, on a, on a month or two months, three months, you'll never see a policeman. <laughs> so in our villages. So that's, that's to me, again, the essence of our, our culture. In fact, when people come visit me, various businessmen, industrialists, all that, I ask them, they'll come in a BMW, Benz, and they'll park it in, a, you know, in this village and in a tea shop or something. I'll say, would you ever worry that it'll get broken into here? They'll look at me funny. You would if you were in Oakland, San Francisco, or even in Palo Alto these days, I tell them. <laughs> So there's something here going on. These people are much poorer. This, nobody can afford a car in, in, a, in a thousand lifetimes, but nobody will break into this car here. So again, that's, there are some strengths like this. Thank you, thank you. So two things I take away from, uh, to, to summarize this one, as uh, Sridhar says, participate in your culture. That is one of the only ways it is going to spread. So. Uh, you are participating in the Taipusham pilgrimage as an inspiration, and I hope many of us take inspiration from it as well. The second point, and I like what uh, Sai said here, our culture spreads by a combination of knowledge and power, not by being squeamish about it, if I could say. With that, um, I'm going to ask a slightly different question now, and I'll start with asking uh, Sridhar this question. This is a bit of a leading question, so pardon me if I'm wrong in asking this question. Why is it that we have been unable to make our mark in the international market with our culture? We, we have not been able to make a mark in technology or any other area too, so that's where it starts, right? South Korean culture is popular because South Korean products are popular. Japanese culture became popular because we all started buying Japanese. So first, no, to me, Technology and culture and uh, economics and spirituality, they all have to go together. In fact, I was uh, once uh, speaking to a yogi and I told them, you know, you have to master mathematics and technology, just like we have to master some of the yogic principles too. And he said, you are absolutely right. <laughs> I said, the Swamiji's are not exempt from mathematics, I told him. <laughs> right? I mean, uh, there is, because we have to teach that, right? And that's the real answer that you have to combine these. We cannot see them as separate worlds. And if we achieve that economic success and the technology success, along with it, demonstrate the contentment, demonstrate spirituality, then that culture will spread automatically. And I wouldn't want this to be a, you know, we go and spread, consciously spread this culture, because that won't work, that's marketing. It, the yoga spread, I mean, there was no marketing done. I mean, it, later somebody else picks up and market it, but it just spreads, so it will spread. And there is an innate strength to this. But we have to demonstrate those. Yes. Actually, you started off on the question that I was going to ask uh, Sai. Uh, I actually said something else, I forgot. But OK, is this the first time both of you are together on our panel? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, OK. <laughs> Thank you. It's an honor that both of us here are here for the first time on a panel. Makes my job I, a little I do difficult. follow him on Twitter. I think he follows. Yeah, of course I, I do. Of course I do. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so interestingly, the, the question that, uh, the point that Sridhar raised is actually the question I've written to ask you. Mm. And I think this is the question that you will enjoy answering. Mm. Yoga is Indian, yet yoga became cool when Westerners adopted it. Yeah, I will leave the rest for you to complete. <laughs> See, there's a, there's a, there's a, 
there's a fundamental approach to dissemination which I think maybe we are missing. Okay, this could be controversial, so be it. <laughs> so <laughs> Storytelling is inherent to human nature and human society. And there are very few societies which are exceptions to the tradition of storytelling. But if storytelling were to then have the purpose of converting the rest of the world to your point of view, then marketing is second habit. Okay? So therefore, if you subscribe to a faith system which does for 10 rupees but believes in showing for 100 rupees, okay? Then effectively, it becomes part of your collective psyche, your social DNA. Whereas if you come from a culture which says, that even if you do for a thousand rupees, keep your mouth shut, right? That's why I made the point of underplaying previously. Because you see this as duty and you don't see this as a means of attracting people to a particular fold. You're doing it for its own sake. Which is why Today, dharma is forced to compete with those ideologies which are so fundamentally different even in their approach to rights and duties that you are forced to think of how do I create a narrative? How do I create an ecosystem? How do I make myself cool? How do I spread the language? How do I spread the message? That's where the problem is. Now, what does this mean? Either the other fellow must have let's say, the conscience to learn that this is not the way to go about it. Or you're forced to Abrahamize to some extent in terms of marketing. It's a very hard decision to make because you are cutting corners at some level. Okay? Now let's go to the next thing. So that's one element. The second element is you have to realize that what we think of our failures in terms of disseminating our culture and so on and so forth, making it cool, is a post-1947 phenomenon, not before that. One man went to the West and revolutionized it. Gandhi. Oh, sorry, not Gandhi, Vivekananda. Why Gandhi? Are you? No way. Not Gandhi. No, no, sorry. Rama Rama. <laughs> you did not have internet, you did not have technology, you had nothing. He goes there, audiences swoon all over the place with one dialogue. That's it. Okay? And then, literally, door to door pravachanas is what gets the job done. What technology? Where is technology? What that tells you is technology is important provided there is a message to send and provided there is a conviction that the message has a purchase and that it is of some value and that you are willing to put yourself out to spread that particular message. Technology will then aid the process of dissemination. It is not the starting point. Now. Post-1947, or at least since the 1920s, if you have chosen to underplay your culture to the extent that you believe that you have nothing of value to offer, and that your entire society is a reform project for the West as well as for westernized Indians, not Bharatiyas, then you please tell me, where is the question of making an effort to spread the message? Each time you try to say something, someone will come and tell you, Mughals gave it. <laughs> From Biryani to Diwali, apparently the Mughals gave us. Whatever remains, the Christian gave us. Then what did they come here for? Oh, no, but they apparently generated wealth. We are poor at generating wealth. Even that we are poor at. So what did they come here for? I don't understand. So what I'm trying to say is when the issue of, let's say, dissemination or making culture is framed 
I think we need to be even more precise in framing the problem. And framing the problem would also mean understanding the timeline in which you choose to frame that problem. So that's where an analytical or a mathematical approach comes into play. Because when someone makes a sweeping statement, that means you've effectively painted an entire history and let's say a 7,000 year journey at the very least with one brush, which uh, does not hold valid at all. If there are coins dating back to the Roman period, which are in Vault A of the Sri Padmanabha Swami Temple, how is that even possible? If you had business, if you had trade, culture flows along with trade. Economics and culture go hand in hand to a significant extent. They have an economic incentive to understand your culture. You have an economic incentive to understand their culture. This happens. So the existence of trade across the world with Bharat is proof of the fact that they had knowledge of our culture. Okay. So I would say the problem that we, we seek to analyze is a post-independence problem which makes it all the more imperative to understand what happened post that particular period that makes us so diffident and let's say, uh, and, and, and let's say, why do we underplay it beyond what is required by our culture? Now the point is this, to underplay it is one thing, which is to say that you know its value, but you choose not to present it for reasons of modesty. But to believe that it has no intrinsic value of its own is not underplaying, is to dismiss and rubbish it. We are not underplaying it anymore. We are rubbishing it altogether, lock, stock and barrel. That's the distinction. The only way that you can hope to overcome this, I go back to my pet to topic, that you remove these layers which have buried your consciousness and then you realize where we come from. Now I'll give you a simple example. Mm. Each time, so during this uh, entire uh, Diwali controversy with respect to firecracker ban, I tried to present material before the Supreme Court, not just with respect to the religious traditions and let's say the ritual traditions surrounding the practice of bursting firecrackers, but to say that we have had this tradition even before Chinese invented, let's say, gunpowder or whatever it is, only to be laughed at by the Supreme Court. This reflects what the Supreme Court, the highest court of the land, thinks of its own culture and its own contributions to science and whatnot. And we were not citing WhatsApp literature or random literature. We were citing literature written by P.K. Gode, who is the legendary historian of Bhandarkar Oriental Research Institute, who while being a librarian at Bori, wrote so many books, close to 600 articles and multiple books. And he had collated information from Krishnadevaraya's period and whatnot, with none of them mentioning our blessed neighbors, unfortunate neighbors on this side, on the Northeast. Nobody mentions them. Nobody mentions them. So that tells you that the root problem is perhaps in understanding history because unless and until you actually have a sense of history, I think it's impossible for us to develop confidence as a society. Whatever confidence we have today is arrogance traceable to Western education but not confidence which is traceable to our Indic knowledge or Indic origins. So. Perhaps that's my analysis, but people can say he's stuck with coloniality and decoloniality. God save him and us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I like the way both of you are feeding into each other's questions and answers. So the one thing I want to give as a summary of this question is um, what Sridhar says, everything goes together. Even Swamiji's have to learn mathematics. And uh, Sai Deepak also said on similar lines that we need science and science analysis, all of it to go together. So for the younger ones in the crowd, if you're planning to give up mathematics, don't. Now, with that, and you actually led me into the next question that I was going to ask you. And this is something you have spoken about extensively and written about extensively in your first book. Uh, I have read it quite well. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a question to both of you. Um, and I want uh, Sai Deepak to start with this. You, s you kind of touched upon this topic as, we, as you uh, answered the previous question. But if you could elaborate on how do we decolonize our thought process when it comes to culture? What is your view? I'll draw from Mr. Vembu's point. You can theorize as much as you want, but if there is no element of practice which is part of your daily life, all of this is useless. <laughs> all of this is useless. 
if for something as esoteric and lofty as moksha you treat experience as the primary pramana so to speak in some ways i would ask myself why would you choose to apply a lesser proof or a lesser source of proof for other aspects mm. if anybody were to let's say go through my timeline of 2015 or until 2015 on twitter i was mouthing the very same nonsense that i accuse people of in my book <laughs> i don't even wish to run away from it because i own up to the fact that whether i've evolved or not i certainly seem to have learned a few things okay and in addition to that what made a huge difference was after the i, th I think i've said this in one of my i think some podcasts that uh, after the sabarimala experience or around that period one of my relatives who is uh, uh, a former civil servant who has given up civil service to do paurohityam in the ncr comes from a lineage of that um, he specifically came and said what is the point of all your talks it's useless don't do it do you do trikala sandhya mandram if not it's useless <laughs> that's it there couldn't have been a royal slap on my face a better slap on my face ठीक है सर ओके चलो देन वील डू समथिंग आई विल नॉट हैव द फर्स्ट मील ऑफ द डे अंटिल आई डू संध्या मंदरम अंडर एनी सर्कमस्टांसेस नाउ द थिंग इज यू कीप ट्रैवलिंग व्हाट डू यू डू देन यू हैव एन एरेटिक स्केड्यूल व्हाट डू यू डू देन वेल दैट्स वेयर यू हैव वर्क अराउंड्स व्हिच इज नॉट टू गिव अप द प्रैक्टिस बट टू एंश्योर दैट द प्रैक्टिस इज इनमेस्ट एज पार्ट ऑफ योर डेली स्केड्यूल हाउ डू यू गो अबाउट डूइंग इट सो अज्यूम फॉर अ मोमेंट सो आई वाज like wembu sir i went for a, uh, let's say a, a pilgrimage of sorts of to several temples now at one place i didn't have the panchapatram for this i didn't have the what do you need the udrani and this things so I, i didn't have it at all what did i do so in telugu we call it kobbari chippa which is the coconut okay so that's what i used as my udrani i didn't have I, that that's what i used as a panchapatram and from that i started doing the uh, the sandhya vandam ritual now what if you don't have water what do you do then so apparently vibhuti is a substitute for water should you not have it now that means consistency is important then there are work arounds but the brilliant answer that i think hindus have given themselves these days is isme kya rakha hai your heart should be clean <laughs> <laughs> what a lousy lazy answer the laziest of answers anybody can give <laughs> heart should be clean it seems our hearts are clean it seems what is this i mean i don't understand that's not the way to go about it that is how you deritualize and that's how you dehinduize that's the straight forward answer in stark contrast despite my serious differences of opinion and i don't believe in hindu jewish friendship like most people do i don't multiple reasons exist it's a collaboration of convenience period but but if you go there the orthodox jew so in 2016 june i was uh, with my family uh, in the us for my brother's convocation i'll just take 30 seconds i'm so sorry so a couple of jewish friends had invited me to deliver a lecture in uh, rochester and they asked me what would be your choice of venue i said the synagogue and they said on which day i said sabbath uh, it was an orthodox jewish synagogue because i wanted to see how they observe it that is the purpose so my talk was scheduled for the lunch session so they said if you want you can come directly to the lunch session we don't wish to offend your religious sensibility so you can skip the entire service i said i will be a part of the entire service from the morning it's a 3 and 1/2 hour service i was there for the entire service wearing the yarmulke and everything i was there and i told them i need one person sitting next to me explaining everything that's going on that's what they did okay and you should see this was the cream of the american society judges lawyers ophthalmologists the dean of the brandeis university this university that university everybody was sitting there and they had attended this particular lecture now the thing is when on sabbath there are rules with respect to access to metal and electronics which are supposed to follow and i told them i will not violate a single rule which violates this particular uh, practice and i did that 
If you go to Israel, people who are in the tech business or whatnot, they need to work, but they also need to observe Sabbath. They've evolved technological solutions to observe Sabbath, by the way. That is commitment. So when someone says technology has to be pitted in an adversarial fashion to religion and whatnot, well, I'm sorry, this is the talk of an idiot who neither understands technology nor religion. <laughs> if you want to do it, you can do it. There is no divide here whatsoever. And I think that divide needs to be broken as far as the Hindu mind is concerned. Of all the, let's say, minds, this is the mind that is most polluted with this particular divide, which has chosen to buy into this binary nonsense. The day we percolate that barrier and break it to smithereens, I think half the job is done. I'm actually going to quote uh, Gandhiji here. Be the change. This, this one really applies to us, right? Be the change you want to see in the world. That was a, that definitely I think it'll be worthwhile break because we, you know, before we think about, you know, spreading culture or we ourselves practicing it, that's first and nothing, that's what he also talked about. Particularly successful people. If you are a successful doctor or a successful civil engineer or entrepreneur, whatever, what are you doing? That's an important thing. That's, uh, I think, because successful people, whether they like it or not, become role models for others. So that's important. And the second aspect is really our education. What are we doing to our children in schools? And I want you to go look at all your children's textbooks. Because, you know, I have looked and it's pathetic. It is sad, okay? Even now, it is still sad. And now I don't know how many of you your children go to this Cambridge curriculum schools. And this has, uh, you know, infected India. The infection is the right word. We have caught that infection. And I looked at this textbook on sociology. It's about a year ago. I took, you know, screenshots just so that, you know, wanted to verify that I actually did look at it and I have the evidence. And this is like 10th grade or 11th grade stuff, I forget now. It's teaching such extremely important subjects like the male gaze, toxic masculinity, all of this to young children at the age of whatever, 12 or 13, 14. So this is going on in our schools and we are paying to educate our kids in all this now. Particularly the middle class, the upper middle class children are getting the full effect of all this. So we have to look at that. I mean, if we want to, you know, we are probably the only society in the world, only major society in the world, which would entrust the education of children to some other culture, so ideas of what is correct education. And this is very important to realize. And the second aspect, language. In fact, uh, this is true in middle classes in all of our cities. Most of our children only grow up speaking English now, right? That also you know. So we have to make sure that they learn our languages. In fact, I have a publicly called for this. Every one of our states should adopt the law that within five years, the entire education will only be in their language. European countries do it, we can do it. We can absolutely do it. We'll teach English, we'll teach English, we'll teach Hindi, but your entire education in the state will be in your own language. People who argue with me, argued with me on Twitter that this is not possible. We have so many languages. Europe has all these languages. And European countries with five billion people, three billion people manage this feat. And Bangalore alone has 16 million people now. So we can definitely manage this feat, <laughs> right? You know, this is serious. I mean, I think people, that's why people who argued with me asked them, do you know numbers? Tamil Nadu alone has 80 million people. That's bigger than Germany in population. And you're arguing with me that Tamil is not a viable language to teach everything. In fact, people do argue this. That's why I said everybody should learn some numbers <laughs> before they argue. <laughs> So, but these all, I mean, these are the serious points I'd make, that successful people should set examples, language is important, education is important, because that's where the cultural transmission is happening. We have to take control of all this. What, that's why I started the school. Frankly, I started the school because, and to me, I felt I won't preach to others, let me go start the school and start this there. The curriculum will have to be set by us. So those are the, the things that I will primarily say. Because if you, if you lose the next generation, you've lost it all completely.
thank you for the thank you for those fantastic points. So the the common again, um, what I like is even though they have very distinct delivery styles, there is a lot of agreement in what they say, uh, which makes my life a little easier. <laughs> so I think the the one takeaway that I have, uh, at least I have, uh, is it is important for us to practice our culture, be role models. Every one of us is a role model for people around us, for our children, and so on and so forth. And that's what both of them touched upon. And the second point was on, uh, of course, education and uh, making making our own children aware of what we have. Uh, I just wanted to add one, just a question to the audience. Uh, I really liked the entire description that uh, Saidi Pak gave about this whole ritual Sabbath in Israel. A very simple question to all of us, honest answer. What do we think of our rituals as? You want to you want to give an answer to that? What do we typically think of our rituals as? Mm, I'll give you an example, and maybe you can understand what this generation thinks of rituals as. There is one gentleman on Twitter. Uh, effectively said that we must make shradh cool. So that the next generation can sit and perform shraddh. And we must learn from Mexican customs apparently to make it cool. When you say that, I think you've completely demeaned the value, the purpose of culture altogether. Allow me to just make this, and this is not a pot shot at making culture cool. Okay? Thank you for stating that. <laughs> 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 I think. Making culture cool would mean making its, let's say, its dissemination and the manner in which it is understood cool, but you don't corrupt and change its practice altogether, then I don't know what is it that you wish to pass on. Because at the end of the day, <laughs> rituals are knowledge codification mechanisms according to me, and they are also a way of, let's say, constantly reminding yourself of your roots. Each time you start with the Abhivadeyam or let's say you start with your Gotram and you start with each of this, you're basically telling yourself this is where I come from, this is where I come from, no matter where I go, I will never forget my roots. So ritual for all practical purposes, according to me, are markers of our journey, which we hope that the next generation will remember as time goes along. So no wonder in, in some of these uh, uh, yagnas and homams, you continue to use wood to generate fire when you can use a lighter if you want to. Right? Then what is the point? So as far as I'm no, no, please continue. Hmm? So as far as I'm concerned, ritual has a very clear dissemination, let's say, uh, goal behind it, but. More than anything else, the amount of discipline that comes with the practice of ritual, you should only experience it to understand it. Nobody else can teach this. It is a way of bringing ekagraha according to me. So that you can focus, razor sharp focus, that comes with the practice of ritual. That's been my personal experience. Gurmurthi ji narrated this uh, uh, thing to me from uh, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa about rituals. A uh, disciple went to him and said, uh, our Advaitic Dharma is the kernel, the rice kernel. All the rituals, all of that is the, the chaff, the umi, we call in Tamil, right? The, so why don't we keep the rice kernel and discard the chaff? You asked him, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa responded, yes, you are right. This is the kernel and this is the chaff. But if you plant the, just the kernel, it won't grow. So you need the chaff to convey it to the next generation. <laughs> so it is the, the this is uh, this is directly from uh, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa's stories. And uh, so you, to convey it to the next generation, and we mentioned this, you absolutely require the ritual. There's no way that we are going to convey our all of our concepts without rituals to young minds. And then later they get on a ladder of self-discovery, as we say. So that is important. And I also agree that part of the today's benefit from ritual is giving up on that phone for at least uh, half an hour, one hour, right? 
that has value <laughs> because we have to set it aside and i the way i do it is you know there's a village pond i go for a swim thankfully we have not invented a way to swim with the phone <laughs> so that's that's useful because you you clear your mind actually when you swim so i do that but this serves that purpose too we said uh, clarity but uh, declutter the mind remove all the clutter so all this is important this is something that we again have to convey to the next generation because it's not going to survive if we don't convey it and i am you no know, again i am actually see this kind of thing even could not have happened 20 years ago or 30 years ago in bangalore because i am old enough to remember that time so absolutely not in chennai you know today it can happen but definitely it would not have happened 15 years ago <laughs> right so things have changed times have changed in our nation so i am optimistic that way this has survived for thousands of years it will survive but we have a responsibility to convey this to our next generation so that's what i would say make it a resolution for each of us uh, thank you so i think what i in the through this panel discussion i hope a lot of you have actually been able to follow the ritual of not being able to see the phone because they have held us in rapt attention uh, having said that uh, ritual as a means of ekagrata is really a sentence that i that i take back and uh, i hope some of us at least take this back as something that we ought to be that we ought to do and uh, very often sadly we tend to look at our rituals as superstition and i hope we grow out of that trap so moving on um, you've actually made it a little difficult because you answered a bunch of my questions which i had written by while you're answering the current question so let me let me see how to recap regroup what i have what i have what i have written and come back to you but yes um see that this question is to you the question is on private initiative you know zoho has shown the way i wanted to talk about your inspiration how did you think of doing this i know you touched upon it a little but if you could elaborate on that what can other organizations do because one of the common excuses that we oh but zoho is big zoho can do it but i can't if you could say what does it mean for smaller organizations people like us if you could translate that See, even when you have say 10 people you can always train a 11th person from a, a person we extend an opportunity to a person who would not have had it even at 10 it's possible okay and we are going into you know a lot of small scale experiments where just one passionate person can go help three or four people and bring them up you know train them all of that we are doing a lot of that now in various uh, villages all that but it also you know once you have even some profit then it immediately raises the question of what are you going to do with it what is the point of wealth right this is where i mentioned we have to evolve a uniquely bharatiya answer to that question because the world definitely absolutely needs that answer today because the world needs that answer to the what are, what are we, in other words what is the vision of india that is reasonably prosperous and this is going you know gdp is already what uh, 2500 dollars maybe 10000 dollars 20000 dollars gdp are we going to burn up the entire planet with that wealth because they are on present trajectory that's what the world is doing all the noise aside about climate change all that nothing on the ground has changed in fact i estimate this is actually my estimate about 7 uh, 8 years ago until i changed my life around this my grandmother in the village i would estimate that she used about 1000th energy i used 1000th so 1 million of indians like me would spend the energy of 1 billion of indians like her <laughs> this order is a magnitude here we are talking about again mathematics is important this was my estimate <laughs> because we have to understand this right every time i did a commute in my car in the us i know i was i was spending as much energy as she would have spent in an entire month so these are important questions what do we do as a wealthy society or a wealthy city all these questions are very very important and for that that's to answer that is to me the purpose of our civilization today because these are not answered western society does not have an answer today for example take this concept of economic growth all the macro economists keep thinking there's somehow perpetual growth we can keep on growing growth forever and and in fact one physicist pointed out 
the growth has to somewhere touch your atoms somewhere touch the real world the moment you touch that your exponential growth goes out the window and the economists don't seem to understand that at all <laughs> that somehow they can have you know their numbers can grow even the numbers need electrons to represent and there's only a finite number of electrons on this earth I'm just say right so it is that we need that somewhere the contentment has to come because we are going to reach those limits of what does it mean to burn up energy what does it mean to grow all of that and our nation our civilization has to figure out those answers that's what i see and that's where to me i said well uh, let me not preach civilization that's as a company we'll figure out the answers so that's why i started doing that and these rural initiatives i am very happy to say our employees by and large are a contented lot and that's actually very important to me in fact i i constantly preach this and 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 i practice it so that's you know people are it's easy to follow them but that's important and then i say you know you are going to make money what do you do with the money go serve your community your neighborhood the people who are poorer people who are less fortunate and that's you know i'm i don't have to say this but could, could people do it now so these are the things that i think i would urge companies to do if we do those things and for example there is a saint on, on the way If near Tirichi, there is a saint who only has two victims. He's a siddhar. Uh, adopt vegetarian diet and feed people. Those are the only two things. He doesn't give you any other advice. You go there. In, he's in Thurayur. I went to the ashram. He only gives two things. Please be vegetarian and feed people. And every day he feeds about 10,000 people through donors. Donations flood in. He doesn't keep a day's donation for the next day or two days later. every day is disposing money and it is keeps on coming a lot of rich people come there and donate liberally i've seen this and so this is again another thing in zoho we have long adopted just feed wherever who ever comes from our uh, employees to our security staff to our housekeeping all of that this is something every company can adopt it's very easy to feed make sure your lowest strata of people have a good food that's something that i would say <laughs> and all of these will spiritually enhance us in fact that uh, siddhar says you once the moment you start feeding your own spiritual stature advances and that's something that i've witnessed in zoho so these are the basic things i would say as as basic practical tips for us thank you i'm going to put this to you in a different way what can what are the things that come in the way of actually making this happen it's it's one thing is to say because i'm sure a lot of people think oh but this is easy for you to say what is your view on what might be coming in the way and therefore how should we look at it this is in the context of his response yes yes right. it's so everybody oh we have, you can do it i can't do it we we have all these excuses and reasons so if you could elaborate on the on what might come in the way and how do we tackle it you know uh, it's a fantastic thing that all these words have come from a self made entrepreneur who is in the tech business you know why this is important assume for a moment you and i had said this we would have been told you are a luddite you are anti development you are anti technology you are anti innovation you have a problem with the west you don't know how to engage with the west you don't live in the real world how will you compete with china same questions will come okay these are the standard questions that will come see the i'll tell you I, i'll multiple thoughts are racing in my head so i'll try to make it as clear as possible China needs to be completely quelled and subdued for actually replicating the western nasty business model at such a macro level because it is singularly responsible for destroying the concept of nature and sanctity of any kind if i had said this as let's say a white man coming from the west i'd have been accused of being anti asian and i don't want the rise of uh, asia so on and so forth but what russia is doing so uh, sorry A china is doing is very problematic and i'll explain why so i have a friend who works on access to justice in the hague and other places so we typically have conversations on what is happening in different jurisdictions on let's say indigenizing justice systems in different countries the west has started thinking about it so when this conversation was going on So I asked her what's her experience with China. So she her name is Kanan Dhru. It's important that she is recognized because these are her views and these are her inputs. As an IP lawyer I have to give attribution. So 
the one thing that she said was they come absolutely prepared for any discussions. Their preparation today outmatches and outstrips the West when it comes to any kind of negotiation. But the deeply problematic aspect of the Chinese society today is that parents are teaching children that the only thing that matters in life is success and the manner in which you achieve it is of no consequence. Do whatever it takes to reach the top. Beg, borrow, steal, finish the other person makes no difference whatsoever. <laughs> that is the Chinese state that you're dealing with at the macro level. Which has no respect for water, for nature, nothing goes about destroying river systems, goes about destroying forest systems, wants to somehow take over Brahmaputra, wants to plant the red flag on Manasarovar, right? So that is the problematic aspect. Now when you're dealing with China, someone comes and tells you, consume less, growth is not enough or it's problematic for multiple reasons, they'll say, live in the real world, are you an idiot? Now you're confronted with that unfortunate situation. So you have to be able to contain China for dharmic reasons, apart from geostrategic reasons. And you should also be in a position to ensure that you don't lose what is so critical to you, not because of its own intrinsic value. I will simply take forward what Mr. Wembers put forth, which is this. Where are the resources if perpetual growth seems to be the mantra across the board? It's not going to happen. The only way, so which is why I think if you look at, let's say, the way in which our culture has evolved, it has been an extremely outgoing culture which has then turned inward. Which is why I keep saying that it reflects the journey of the human civilization, wherein you decide that when everything is um, in abundance, I need agriculture, I need to feed people, I need to do this, I need the concept of a settlement, I need the concept of a village, city, so on and so forth. And then, even when resources were in plenty and abundance, the realization dawns on the people of this particular culture, how will nature survive when this is what drives and most importantly, what happens to the rights of other beings who are non-humans? What do you do then? I'll say this as someone who has three dogs, okay? I pity animals, literally pity animals. Not on the context of Diwali or whatever it is, but our tendency, our tendency to ride roughshod over their, let's say, habitat to build apartments and whatnot is unbelievable, unbelievable. So during uh, the lockdown in Noida, for the first time after several years, the Neil guy was found wandering on the streets, which is typically found only in forests. The Neil guy had come out walking outside the malls of Noida. So when you shut up, nature will have the time to speak and finally assert itself. So that's one. Second thing, it's okay to, I mean, the problem with vegetarianism argument is they'll immediately say, here comes the Brahmin pushing his agenda. No, it's not. Ultimately, what is it that you're trying to do? Contribute to ways in which you can reduce your dependence on nature, period. Is there a way that you can reduce your consumption without giving up on your basic nutrition levels? That's the balance that you try to achieve. That's the trade-off that you make. Now, therefore, my argument is going to be that the way of the future, whether you like it or not, climate change is standing in front of you with its mouth wide open like a mudra rakshasa. <laughs> you have no other option but to take it so seriously because if you don't, as uh, I think, uh, who is that stand-up comedian? I just love watching him who specifically said, you're not trying to protect nature, you're trying to protect yourself. Nature will simply hit reset and that'll be the end of the equation. That's it, correct? Yep. Fantastic. That I think is true. So you're trying to protect yourself against nature's wrath. You're doing no favors to nature, by the way. It'll survive on its own. It knows its way of hitting the reset button and then the cycle starts. You hope that the cycle doesn't start in your lifetime. <laughs> That's all you're hoping for. And therefore, the stupidity is, we'll try and push this as much as possible. That means you don't even have concern for your own children or your grandchildren and you continue to have families. What logic is this? So you have to find ways of striking that balance. This is not an anti-innovation argument. I am saying that the future of innovation lies in finding a balance between this, 
please do not adopt the Elon Musk model who thinks that Earth is a pit stop to Mars or some other planet. That is the most irresponsible argument possible. I don't subscribe to that under any circumstances. Whether the technology for that is in the foreseeable future or future or not doesn't make a difference to me. I am saying this is the white colonizing mindset which chooses to use every planet to consume litter and run away. Then from there, where will you go? You'll finally go to the sun or what? <laughs> Makes no sense. As an engineer turned lawyer who practices intellectual property, which is as Western a form of intellectual property or property as it can get, allow me to say this. The way of the future is green innovation significantly and striking a balance between growth, prosperity and consumerism. That I think is what we should learn from and in, in that particular department I think Mr. Vembo is leading the way. I, I have one thing to add. Uh, you talked about China. I'm going to, I'm not going to offer a defense of China but I'm going to balance it a little bit. Harvard Business School and the Communist Party are actually cousins, <laughs> if you think deeply about it. Once you think deep enough about it, so don't just knock China alone, okay? That's also. <laughs> and in fact, the moment you go to dualism, the materialism, all of it, you will inevitably go to that same dead end. What the Communist Party of China has done and what the Harvard Business School is doing it more slowly but going there the same destination. I actually said this many years ago and people were shocked when I said this. I said the Soviet communists, the same fate the Harvard Business School ideology will meet. And it's inevitable because it is, it is leading there. You see the social strife, all of that, it is coming from that. And so this, the, the, we, the climate change again. See the conservatives in America, for example, totally deny that there is any climate change at all. And I don't know why they even call themselves conservatives. There is no conservation there at all. <laughs> right? There's no conservation. I will just look at it and I'll deny it. And so we, the people who believe in dharma, who actually are dharmic, have to totally the, look at the planet entirely. And now China, I'm going to say this. I, we have an operation in China. So I have uh, some insight into the, into the society there. I have traveled a uh, few times. Chinese do realize these problems. Okay, it's not like even at the senior level in the party or anywhere, they don't realize it. Just they are trapped. See, this paradigm, they are trapped. And I see, for example, the party has adopted a de uh, a re ruralization strategy now in the last few years. In other words, they have grown their cities big enough. They have seen the dead end there. It leads to culturally, socially, all that. The Chinese are actually worried about Chinese culture, losing 5,000 years of Chinese civilization. They are very worried about it. And then they go analyze it and they, it's reflecting back at them. In other words, the party is looking in the mirror and they know who is responsible. Right? They may not admit it, but they know. And so this rural, again back to rural strategy, this the Communist Party has adopted, believe it or not. It's, act, it's, a, it's going on. You will see articles about this. And again, they are going about it in a very ham-fisted way, again, as though from Beijing you can control all this, all of that, but still they are doing it. But in our context, what I do believe, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm an optimist somewhat, I do believe that it's possible. I do believe it's possible to have enough, live happy, and not be deprived of food or shelter, all of that, and not burn up all the energy in the world. And it's, and I go back to my grandmother, told her. I mean, she was happy, she lived to 82, but she spent 1,000 the energy I did. So, and that's the lifestyle I want to adopt. And it's possible. I mean, she lived a nice home, rural home. It's big enough, nice enough. It had cows in the backyard, all that. She would milk the cows herself. All of that lifestyle. And it is possible. I want you to tell you that it, it's possible and it's, com you know, it is also not contradictory to technology, all of that. We can have our cell phones, but we can also milk cows. These are some of the things that I'm doing there. So. Thank you so much for uh, for that. I'm going to um, ask you a to 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 give you a, ask you a futuristic question to both of you. Uh, I looked at a bunch of questions, and this is finally what I decided. Imagine a world of Indian culture at its peak. Paint a picture for us. What would that look like in your imagination? Likely, you have done it already to some extent, but still. There is a. 
a Zen uh, thing, right? What happens before enlightenment? You chop wood, you carry water. What happens after enlightenment? The monk says you chop wood and you carry water. <laughs> so life will look much the same. <laughs> we'll still, as I said in our villages, you know, after do we finishing the pilgrimage, people will come back and do the fighting also. <laughs> so that's, you know, and this is where I side with the Buddha. As long as humans are there, some suffering will be there, right? That's inevitable. <laughs> That's not pessimism, it's just realism, right? But at its, no, first of all, I'll even lose the notion of what is the peak. Because then, then what follows is down. <laughs> so we want a plateau, we want a steady state, right? And that steady state will look like we just burn a lot less energy, we are contented, we do small fighting here and there, not the big wars. So this is again, this is actually another one, my familiar uh, thing that at small scale, lot of vices we can get away with. Small vices at small scale. A small fight between few families in the village is easily contained. Big war between nations. Well, no, today we hope that it doesn't happen between India and China, all of that, because that could destroy the earth. Similarly, small financial flows, small amounts of debt, easy to manage. When you aggregate it to gigantic flows, the whole global financial crisis. So these are, you know, in other words, the argument is for the small. You have to reduce it to smaller scales. I think that's what I would do. Perfect. So in the interest of time, I'm going to move into a rapid fire round. Quick five questions, if you could also pick up the mic. Um, Indian culture in one word. I already used it, contentment. Contentment. Samskara. Samskara. What is the challenge in front of us? One word. Originality. For me, the challenge is to practice that contentment. Practice and contentment, okay. Uh, your most enjoyable cultural experience? Food. Food, okay. <laughs> Carnatic music. Sorry? Carnatic music. Carnatic music. Oh. I think that should be music to some of our audiences, yes. <laughs> One word to the audience, a call to action. Anyone? Fastest fingers first. <laughs> I, I, I would repeat Gandhiji's dictum, be the change you want to see in the world. Okay. Change okay. yourself, change yourself. That's the, that's, that's, our, that's the deepest of Hindu philosophy. Be, no, change yourself. Okay. Perhaps the other side of the coin is what I would go with, self-reliance. Self okay. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I had a bunch of audience questions. All of them, we have yeah. gone for lucky draw. So okay. there are some lucky people who got their questions onto the stage now. We'll read them out so that it moves in the way. Just a couple of them because I think we are, yeah. yeah. Some really good questions, but I also think you've answered a lot of them. How do we spread our culture? In short, quick words if you could think of it. How do we spread our culture? Because it's an, it's an audience question. How do we spread our culture as cool? Regardless of what you said before. <laughs> quick couple of words if you could. Yeah. I'll give a negative answer hopefully. Okay. Not through Bollywood. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This Actually, if you look at our culture, I'd say we have so many elements. This is a nice thing about our thing, whether it's music, art, food, all of it. And the worship of the rocks, the worship of the tree, the worship of the snake, all of it. The festivals, colorful. So practice vigorously. That's okay. what I'd say. Practice vigorously, all okay. of it. Embrace it. Okay. This is a question to Sai, but I'm actually going to ask it to you. Is decolonialization really possible? So short answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would think it is possible. Okay. Because we are, see, after a thousand years of uh, being enslaved, one way or the other, we have only slowly started coming into our own. We are a slow nation, and I like being slow, slow. so it's okay. good. <laughs> okay, thank you. I think uh, one from these questions, thank you so much. There's a lot of appreciation for the work you have done uh, and, and, for, and, for, and, and for the work you do as well. And I wish we could go through all these questions, but at some point we really have to bring this to an end. So I'm going to thank Sridhar and Sai for having a wonderful panel discussion.
Wow, a standing ovation. Thank you. Thank you for the scintillating conversations and the thought-provoking discussions. You literally kept us at the edge of our seats. And now, we, we, we come to the section of the launch of Devabhasha, a gamified way to learn Sanskrit. Um, and we've received some stunning feedback on the design and approach from the Toykathon 2021 award. Out of the 17,000 entries that were there for Toykathon 2021, <laughs> we were one of the 220 winners. Toykathon was organized by Government of India. Now, can I ask the creators of the game, Neela Kanton, Tapan Mittal Deshpande, Harsh Pandya, and Dr. Swaroop Ranganath on stage, please. Request Sri Sridhar Vembu and Sri Jesai Deepak to open the game kit and officially launch Devabhasha. Now let's hear from the creators of this game. Just in one sentence, Neil, can you share a high point for you in the making of Devabhasha? So for me, the high point was that we could actually convert a basic part of Samskrita into a game. It was a very, very high point because I didn't think the project was possible. Multiple points where I thought we would have to give up. But the fact that we actually made it is a high point. Harsh, what was the most challenging moment for you in the journey? Hi. Uh, good evening. Uh, the challenge was to take something which is spoken, uh, that's a different sense, to make it a visual, you know, and an understandable and easy to learn and fun to play kind of a game. So it was very interesting to know what Sanskrit has as a structure and once you decode that it's really it's really just fun to like play around and it's like it's like a metro map right so if you've seen the game uh, some of you have uh, it's like if you want to go from uh, Ganganagar to let's say uh, <laughs> here. to the south of here yeah, to here so you you connect the points and you come to a certain place so that it was a very interesting process, and challenging you, uh, and at you the same time. you learned a little bit of Sanskrit also, right? Very little, but let's not <laughs> test that. <laughs> Thank you, Harsh. Tapan, share with us a memorable moment for you in this journey. Uh, I think the most memorable part of this journey has been co-creation. And taking two words from the talk today or the discussion today is organic and contentment. I think these two words define this process of co-creation and three cheers to the entire team for organizing this. Thank you. Thank you, Dapan. Swaroop, being a Sanskrit expert yourself, how was your experience in the journey of making a game from a language that you know so well? And he said he cannot answer in one sentence, so more sentences for you. <laughs> so if you look at the entire Indian scriptures, there is one word which it boils down to, anubhava, anubhuti. If you read the entire Shankara Bhashya, Madhva Bhashya, Ramanuja Acharya's Bhashya, they all speak about one language in one word, Anubhava. So what we are missing today is the Anubhava, and there is too much of theorization, there is too much of talk, and if you have to bring down Indian culture back, I think we have to get this Anubhava, and this is exactly what our panelists have been speaking, that Anubhava is something no other culture can create. And this culture, the Anubhava, what it creates is so unique. So. Uh, this was the first challenge Neil gave me. How can we convert this into an Anubhava? So, game. Now, you don't have to learn Sanskrit through a textbook anymore. It is an Anubhuti. And you can play, and you can play, and you can play, and the more you play, you become a master in a language. Can you believe that? 
and probably this attempt is not just from a, the, from the perspective of Sanskrit. I don't think any other language experts have tried to bring language to a level of a game. So this was a first, first uh, approach. And I want to add one be very beautiful, interesting point about Sanskrit here. The entire Sanskrit is structured in just seven vibhaktis. Okay, for all those who know what vibhakti is. And you know what? The entire human conversation has been hidden in just seven vibhaktis. How did a Rushi do this? You bring any language, you put a sentence across in front of me, I will put that in any of the seven vibhaktis. So that is a mathematical precision, whatever Rishis had when it comes to delivering a language. They put the entire human conversation in just seven vibhaktis. So if something is already mathematically precise, structured, logical, I think converting it to a game which, which requires a pattern is much easy. So Sattva is very um, honestly trying out a few more things. If, the moment we speak of the word Bhagavad Gita today, unfortunately, we think of a religion or a philosophy or a textbook. So today we want to bring down Bhagavad Gita to an Anubhava. So we have written 18 stories actually, and all of these are getting into a short movies very shortly. So what these 18 stories become is, at the end of each story, you know it is the, the summary of one chapter. The moment you look at Bhagavad Gita as an Anubhava, it is no more going to be a philosophy. So, so this is our entire attempt at Sattva. We want to convert everything into Anubhava. So with this, with this entire perspective, we, we, we have been collaborating with uh, many other academies and culture is one of the uh, first to begin with. And we have come a long way ahead. Uh, thank you for coming here and one last thing. I really want to, uh, if I, if I can use the word persuade. We have created this and if you guys don't buy, I don't think we should be able to do go to the next level. So I request all of you to buy it. When you buy it, start playing it, start gifting it, I think you will probably make sense with what we are, what we are doing and probably you will start liking and you will take one step to collaborate with us some, with something much bigger. So this is our request, buy, collaborate with us, come up with ideas and we are ready to work. We have almost 40 projects in the line. I'm not kidding, I'm not exaggerating. And we need a strong support system from, and I, we are not trying to have any personal accomplishment. Uh, ours is all about a collective growth. So if you have to grow, we have to grow as a, as a society together, and we need support from all quarters, and we are looking for collaborators, and that's all I have to tell you. Please buy one copy before you go back home today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swaroop, and thank you all creators. The journey of making a Sanskrit game has required multiple experts to come together, as you have seen. Sattva, founded by Dr. Swaroop Ranganath, who has made our life easy with Sanskrit expertise and a lot more, like you just saw. The volunteers from this team, Sattva, Thoughtport Designs, Tapan Mittal Deshpande, who brings alive our sketchy ideas and makes them presentable and our illustrator, Harsh Pandya, who breathes life into our concepts with his rich illustrations. Along the way, along the way, we have met fantastic collaborators like Thoughtport Designs, Harsh Pandya, and Sattva, and this is our story in a nutshell. We have tried to reimagine, regenerate, and rekindle an interest in Indian culture, and with that, we come to the end of this beautiful evening. Thank you, Dr. Sridhar Vembu, and Shri Jaisai Deepak. <laughs> and Shri Radgar for gracing today's occasion. The fact that we have had such accomplished individuals uh, to encourage us in our tiny steps that we have taken makes us feel really, really special. Like they say, it takes a village. Dr. Swaroop Sharma and Team Sattva for all the background work and being a solid shoulder to lean on. And we have worked uh, really tirelessly to plan an event like this. This is our first time. This is a big day for us. So thank you for all the volunteers. <laughs> Wherever you are, please put your hands up or stand up. Thank you. Thank you really for tirelessly working behind the scenes to make this event a success. Thank you, photographers, videographers, for capturing our special moments. And thank you, Rohit Basi, for the funky graphics, which you're all taking home today, the card that you all have in your hands, and the beautiful designs that you see here. Thank you, Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan, for the venue, stage, and all the support. And thanks to our uh, spouses, who have been rather patient throughout this journey, including the journalism bloopers, 
This is an inside joke, by the way. And if you want to know more, you can meet our spouses outside. And uh, last but not the least, thank you for all the volunteers. Uh, Charlie.com for streaming it live. Uh, Skanda is here. Thank you, Skanda, and thank you, Shale. Uh, a heartfelt thank you to each one of you for really uh, sacrificing a couple of hours from your precious weekend, braving through the Bangalore traffic in a rainy weather, and coming here and supporting us in such huge numbers. Really, thank you. <laughs>